So my name is Matthew Mayer. I am honored again to be back. Truly, this is part of my family, the Cornerstone Peeps. It is good to be here. If you recall, the last time I was with you, I was with my wife, and we were currently expecting. But since then, on May 10th, 30 days ago, we welcomed Willow Joy to the world. Beautiful baby girl. Thank you. Since that moment, we have been over. Joyed and overwhelmed all at the same time. Parents know what I'm talking about. But don't be fooled, that picture is the piece that came after a storm. <laughs> Literally. Our daughter, upon entering the world, swallowed what is called meconium. They said she swallowed a large amount, which means they instantly did not allow that skin to skin moment between baby and mom. They took this little baby over to a tray. And they proceeded with all these nurses around her. It was a crazy scene to see. I'm in shock. They're literally pumping her. They're putting tubes down her throat. They're trying to get all the meconium out. I'm frozen. It happened so quick. They literally realized they had to get her from the delivery room to the NICU. So they take baby. They bring it over to mom. They let her hold her for literally two seconds. They then rush Willow, asking me to join them in the NICU. We get there. Again, I don't know what to do. I'm standing next to all this equipment, the team of nurses. I'm in shock, but here's what I saw. My little baby on the tray, her chest going up and down a million miles per hour, trying to breathe. They have this oxygen mask on her little face, and they're pumping her. They're literally about to go to the next level of the procedure where they would actually put some tubes down her throat into her respiratory system. And I only did what instincts told me to do. I began to speak to her. Hey, baby. Hey, Willow, Daddy, Daddy's here. C calm down. Relax. And in that moment, they said the numbers on the screen began to slow down. She began to calm down. The nurse came over. I didn't know if I was doing something I shouldn't be doing. She goes, Dad, keep talking to her. I literally kept speaking to my daughter, and she came to a complete state of rest. The nurse was in shock. She said, I can't believe this. We were about to go to the next level. We're going to hold off and monitor her. And in that moment, I realized something. Not only did she recognize my voice, I used to read scripture to her when she was in the womb. But in that moment, she heard her father's voice and it brought instant ease, rest, and peace. And I say that amazing testimony pales in comparison to us as God's children when we tune in to hear the father's voice. When you hear his voice, one person appreciated that. I love the enthusiasm. When you hear God's voice, oh, instant peace, instant relief, the peace that follows that storm. What a lesson to learn. Now, of course, because of that intimate moment with my daughter, you better believe that I am convinced that I am already her favorite. <laughs> And though mom would completely disagree, I have proof. You see, in this picture, she's saying, I know who my daddy is, but who are you? <laughs> oh, look at the spunk in that one. She's heard daddy preach four times so far. And clearly, she is not impressed. <laughs> but you know what? She's 30 days old. What's your excuse this morning? But in all seriousness, parents, you know, holding that child for the first time in your arms, overwhelmed with a love that is indescribable. And in that moment, I realized, though I don't even know this child, you don't get to see their personality just yet, I am so in love with her I will provide and protect her. I will do anything. In fact, if it came down to her life or all of your lives, <laughs> y'all gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> but consider what a good God did when he gave us his son. When he gave us Jesus, when he allowed his son to be sacrificed in that moment, knowing that all the sin of the world, past, present, and future, would be hurled upon his holy son, Jesus would take 
all of our guilt, all of our shame. And in that moment, instead of Jesus on the cross saying these words, Father, do not hold them guiltless. He said a prayer of forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you understand in that prayer, in that moment, when you look through the lens of the cross, you see that forgiveness is not something that God has done partially. You realize forgiveness is something God has done fully, freely, and forever. He extended grace, mercy. We just sang it. Our sins are many. His mercy is more. He extended forgiveness when the hate of the world and the evil was at its highest. That moment, evil, oppression, the religious leaders mocking, laughing, the Roman executioners, their practice, brutality, and then the demonic world. You better believe in that moment when you would expect God to literally unleash punishment upon his creation, he does the opposite. He gave us what we did not deserve. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 53, 12. We know he was the one who made intercession for the transgressors. For our transgressions, Jesus paid our sin debt in full. Church, look at me carefully. This is truly what it means to be Christian. Anything less than what I just said is anti-Christ. When I say anti-Christ, I mean against Christ, opposing his heart. The makeup and mission of God's heart is mercy over judgment. It's compassion over condemnation. It is forgiveness over vengeance. See, the basis of Christianity, C.S. Lewis went into a conference one time and actually they were debating about what makes Christianity unique and different from every other world religion. He walked in upon a discussion and they literally said, this is our problem. What do you think about it? C.S. Lewis said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. What makes Christianity different than every other world religion? Grace, unmerited, undeserved favor and forgiveness. And that's why C.S. Lewis was able to say these words. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Lest we think that there are things in our lives that have happened against us or to us that we cannot forgive for, this quote alone reminds us that because God forgave us for the things that are inexcusable, then we, on the basis of our faith, need to be first and foremost to forgive. Church, God's greatest deed meets man's greatest need. And your greatest need is to be forgiven of your sins. In 1974, this is a hard one, 10-year-old boy named Chris Carrier got off a bus and was instantly abducted, taken, stabbed in the back several times with an ice pick. Then the assailant took a gun, put it to his temple, and pulled the trigger. The bullet went in his left temple and exited his right temple. He then took his cigarette and began to burn young Chris's body believing him to be dead. Six days later, December 26th, the day after Christmas, Chris was seen dazed and confused on the side of a road. Somebody pulled over, took him to the hospital. It was the boy that had been missing, still alive, blind in one eye because of that bullet, severing his eyesight. 10 years old. Can you imagine the weight the fear. Chris said he couldn't sleep. Nightmares, night terrors would go into his parents' room every night. Didn't want to leave his house. Was completely paralyzed by real fear. 13 years of age, three years later, he went to a camp for kids his age. And it was at the camp where he heard the gospel presented for the first time. And he realized that there was a God that loved him, a God that had a plan for him. And in that moment, young Chris gave his life to Christ. And he says he realized it was in that moment where true hope, peace, and security entered his soul. And he realized, though he did not know who this person was that did that to him, he recognized as a teen that if God forgave him, then he needs to forgive them. And he literally 
said in his heart, I forgive that individual, whoever it was. Went on with his life in his 30s, got married, had some beautiful children. 22 years later, after the statute of limitations had ran out for attempted murder and kidnapping, 77-year-old David McAllister confessed to that crime. 22 years later, this horrific incident comes flashing back to Chris's soul. But he says in that moment, it wasn't anger that came over him. It was mercy. And he realized he wanted to meet this individual, went into the nursing home where 77-year-old, frail and broken from life of criminal behavior, David McAllister was in shock to find out the boy that the crime he confessed was this boy standing before him. Chris then opened up the Bible and began to take David through a series of Bible studies, visiting him every single day, ultimately saying, I forgive you for what you did, and then leading David into the salvation of the Lord. David died soon after that. When people heard about this, they were in shock. In fact, many people were appalled that David would forgive so easily. He actually said this in one of those interviews. I know the world might view me as the victim of a horrible tragedy, but I consider myself the victim of many miracles. How do you like the use of that word? He says, while many people can't understand how I could forgive David McAllister, from my point of view, I could do nothing but forgive him. If I'd chosen to hate him all these years or spent my life looking for revenge, I would not be the man I am today, the man my wife and children love, the man God has helped me to be. Nobody claimed the body of David McAllister. Chris did. Made the funeral arrangements. You see, though there is a statute of limitation on crimes committed, there is, There's no statute of limitation on the love and forgiveness of Jesus. Oh, that never runs out. It is inexhaustible. And this is the basis of forgiveness. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For you, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Your trespasses. If you're familiar with your Bible, Matthew chapter 6, the few verses that lead up to this verse is known as the Lord's Prayer. By and large, we call it the Lord's Prayer. It goes, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory. Amen. Verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, my heavenly Father will forgive you. In other words, these verses are a footnote to that prayer. This verse right here is the only part of the prayer that has an underscore. It's the only part of the prayer that has a prerequisite that we forgive because we've been forgiven. You see, forgiven people forgive people. This verse was the basis of an entire community's forgiveness. October 2nd, 2006, a man named Charles Roberts went into an Amish schoolhouse, dismissed every single student and teacher except for 10 girls, lined them up, and attempted by execution style to kill each one of them. Five of them were killed. Within hours of this horrific tragedy, this heinous crime against children, within hours, the Amish community, even the parents of those who just lost children, they went to the widow's house, the killer's widow, knocked on her door and extended flowers, food, and forgiveness. They then went to Charles Roberts' parents' house and did the same thing. Again, when the media heard about this, they were enraged that they forgave so easily. In fact, they said, this cannot be healthy. There must be something going on with this Amish community. They asked an older woman about that. 
She literally chuckled in her response and said, do you think that we had a meeting about our forgiveness? You see, it was their duty, each of them, whether a parent, a grandparent, or even a friend in that community, all of them when asked about their mercy they gave, they quoted this verse, Matthew chapter 6, 14 and 15. Do you understand? 75 people showed up to the killer's funeral. Half of that number were the Amish. Parents who buried their children the day before showed up and they made a wall locking arms to keep the media out. Let me say it like this. Before the blood of these children had even dried, they were showing the world how the blood of Jesus should be rightly applied. Forgiveness. So why do we fail to forgive? I'm going to present two reasons that I believe we fail to forgive because of. The first reason I believe we fail to forgive is because we fear that forgiveness equals acceptance. That if I forgive you for what you did against me, that I'm saying that what you did was acceptable. But forgiveness is not saying that the person who hurt you is right. In fact, forgiveness is cutting the right to revenge. Forgiveness does not mean you condone the offense. Forgiveness means you are willing to let go of the hurt so that resentfulness cannot grow in your heart. So how do we do this? We just sang it. We just sang about God's mercy being more than my sin. We just sang about where our sins and transgressions go. God remembers them no more. He puts them at the bottom of the sea. He throws them as far as the east is from the west. We cast our minds to Calvary. Do you believe that? Is that just a theory in the church? When I say I cast my mind to Calvary, I'm saying that the grace God gave me is the empowerment that helps me forgive you no matter what you've done. Now, I am never going to under score or, or downplay or downgrade anybody's hurt in here. Oh, grief is real. Pain is real. Something that may have happened to you when you were a child. All these years later, I say that now and something just moved in your heart. Physical abuse. Sexual abuse. Molestation. Verbal assaults. Offenses. I am not standing on this platform telling you it's easy to get over. I know emotionally it is not. I am standing up here out of God's word, beckoning, inviting, encouraging you to put your mind on the cross. And it's at the cross where the mercy of God begins to flow through your life. And again, you're not condoning what happened to you. You are literally saying no to the resentfulness that wants to grow inside of you. Any sin committed against us, no matter how terrible, is actually trivial compared to our sin against God. And if he's forgiven us for so much, why do we fail to forgive for so little? Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? It's noteworthy to know that the rabbinical teaching of the day said that a good man should forgive three times. But after three offenses, he no longer had to forgive. So when Peter comes to Jesus, he's understanding the common teaching was three times, and he elevates it, presenting a spiritual posture, basically saying, Jesus, seven times? Jesus says to Peter, I do not say to you up to seven times. How about up to 70 times seven? In other words, where did you get that, Peter? Then he tells a parable. In the parabolic teaching, we're going to consider two servants who have two debts. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. Let me define these monetary values. One denarii in that time was one day's wage. After you worked your day, you would get paid one denarii. Thank you. 
one denarii, one day's wage, one talent is 6,000 denarii. One talent is 6,000 days wage. This servant owes 10,000 talents. That's 10,000 talents times 6,000, according to one denarii. That's 60 million days wage. That is an insurmountable amount. You cannot pay that back. 60 million days wage. Verse 25. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all they had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt, forgave him fully, forgave him freely. You'd think he'd leave with a new mindset, humbled, grateful, excited for new beginning, just been forgiven. But no, verse 28 tells us the servant went out, found one of his servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Somebody owed him a hundred days wage. He just got a debt of 60 million days wage, cleared and canceled, laid hands on him, took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. You see, that's what we do. When God cancels our debt, we so easily go and hold our proverbial hand to somebody's throat, holding against them what they did to us. And we justify in our mind, don't we church? We say that I am, I'm in the right to hold this against them. Look at me. The Christian who says, I cannot forgive, according to scripture, will not be forgiven. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all I owe. And he would not, but went and threw him in prison till he should pay the debt. So when the other servants saw what had been done, they were grieved. They came and told the master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him to himself, said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35. The Lord of love, the God of grace, the master of mercy, Jesus says, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. See, that's the basis of our faith. It's called the rudiments, the basics. A, B, C, one, two, three. We forgive because we've been forgiven. That's theological. But you know, unforgiveness is also physiological. Did you know unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentfulness in a heart, in a, in a life, actually has physiological effects? You could see somebody who's harboring resentment over time. It begins to manifest in their physical countenance. Physiologically, we are in need of forgiveness, cutting the ties of resentfulness. This is why Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, he begins by saying, Take heed to yourself. Offenses are going to come, but woe to you if they come through you. Then he says, take heed to yourself. In other words, church, your faith is your personal responsibility. Protecting your heart. Guard your heart above all else, for out of it flows the issues of life. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. We like that part right there. He doesn't stop, though. If your brother sins against you and asks for forgiveness, forgive him. If your brother sins against you seven times in one day and then comes back to you seven times and repents, Jesus says, forgive him. Jesus is asking, inviting, commanding, swift, full forgiveness. The disciples, it says in response, they say to him, increase our faith. Now I'm going to tell you the bottom line up front. They say increase our faith because they're like, there's no way we could keep forgiving somebody that's offended us. Really, Jesus? Seven times in a day? Oh, no, I'm not giving that person access to my life anymore. Jesus says, no, no, I'm not going to increase your faith. 
Jesus tells a parable which is about unleashing our faith. You don't need more faith. You need to unleash your faith. Why? Because the power of life and death are in the tongue. Jesus then tells them this mini parable. He says, if, the, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you could say to this mount, mulberry tree, excuse me, be pulled up by the roots, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. A lot of imagery here. The imagery is worth explaining. First and foremost, if you have just a little bit of faith, a mustard seed was one of the smallest seeds in the botany world. That little seed yielded a tree in disproportionate size than its original form. In other words, it's just a little bit of seed and it wields this wild and strong tree. Jesus, I don't want you to have more faith. I want you to unleash the faith you have. He then brings reference to a mulberry tree or a sycamine tree, which grew rampant in the Middle East. That tree survives in dry, hot, and arid climate, rainless environment. That tree has an extensive and deep root system. It goes so deep into the earth, it actually taps into an underground water source, which would explain how it's able to survive and even thrive in the blistering hot heat of the Middle East. But not only that, if you tried to cut down that tree, if you did not remove every root, the tree would return fuller and stronger. It had a deep root system. This sycamine tree also had durable wood. In fact, because it was so rampant and the wood was so durable, it was the choice wood to manufacture or make a casket or a coffin. They call it the casket tree, symbolic of death. Finally, this sycamine tree produced defective fruit. It produced fruit, but the fruit was bitter, sour. It looked just like a fig, but it didn't taste like a fig. In fact, if you were to eat the fruit of a sycamine tree, it would take you all day to finish one. It was that bitter, one bite, and you would just chew on it and chew on it, and you'd swallow it, and it would be nasty to the taste, and then you would take another bite all day long with one defective fruit, and it even had an interesting and damaging reproduction process. You see, a wasp would sting the fruit to pollinate the tree. A wasp would sting the fruit to pollinate and reproduce defective fruit. What's the spiritual implications here? The extensive and deep root system is bitterness and unforgiveness. They go deep down into the human soul. Jesus, when he says, use your tongue to speak forgiveness out, is pulling up the sycamine tree so that it can't take roots deep in your heart. He says it's durable like the wood of a casket as if you're burying yourself spiritually by not forgiving somebody. Nothing's worse than a bitter believer. In fact, those two words are contradictory. The reproduction process, of course, when you don't deal with an offense, you can't properly, with a good perspective, see what is actually a true offense. You get stung over and over again, and that bitterness and unforgiveness in the heart just produces fruit. And here's what that fruit wants other people to know. They want you to know how bad they hurt. They want you to chew on their hurt, taste their pain. They invite you to join the meal of their misery. And sometimes it's contagious, isn't it? Bitterness. But God's standard for his children, the Christian, is that we're first and foremost in forgiveness. That's why I am convinced, look at me, the only cure to the poison of bitterness is the antidote of forgiveness. Now, you already know my testimony. My heart is near and dear to a story like that. My life is an example of when forgiveness is extended and then received, how it can live in true freedom. I went away on the day, January 7th, 2010, that I'll be physically incarcerated for the next five years. I went away never freer, never to look back again, not in regret, 
I have moments where that guilt rises up in me, but I gotta remind myself that what Jesus did on the cross is greater than what I did against him and that family. Forgiveness given. As I'm penning this message, I am reading accounts and testimonials and watching videos and bringing forgiveness to life. I'm writing this and a notification pops up on my phone. I pause, I go to my Instagram, I read a direct message from a stranger and this is what he wrote me. In that moment, I just watched a video of you set in jail as you gave your story. I am in tears and so touched by the forgiveness that you received from the son of the victim of your accident. I feel disgusted with myself because I have a heart that holds and can't forgive. I think your story just sent a crack rippling across my chest. I, of course, followed up with him, but I pray today that Christ fills that crack and begins to set him free. Did you see the ripple effect of forgiveness? I was given forgiveness, and this man watched me get forgiven, and he realizes he needs to be forgiven, and he needs to forgive. All of that to say this, that first reason we fail to forgive, we think that forgiven equals acceptance, leads into the second reason why I believe people fail to forgive. I believe people fail to forgive because they don't feel like forgiving. Let me say it like this, forgiveness does not come by way of emotion. Forgiveness comes by way of volition. Volition is decision of your free will to choose God's will, and God's will is always to forgive. If you are waiting until you feel like forgiving, you will be waiting forever because forgiveness isn't a feeling. You will never get around to it. You can think of something that's happened to you, even something you've done, Pursuing forgiveness or giving forgiveness, you will never get around to it because you just won't feel it. Nor did Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy, they were incarcerated during World War II, of course, for helping the Jews. They were thrusted into a concentration camp, literally a world they never thought they'd be in. It was a brutal world. There was torture. Betsy eventually died because of that experience. Corey would live to tell about the hope that she experienced through that storm. She went out on a speaking circuit. She landed in Germany, realizing this land war torn, these people, they need to hear a message of forgiveness. So here she is at a church in Munich, telling people her testimony about God forgave her, and she's here to let them know that God forgives them too. She brings up where she was locked up at, a concentration camp called Ravenbrook. In the midst of her story, she sees a man rise up and begin to walk through the crowd. She recognizes his face, and although he was wearing street clothes, she instantly flashed back to who he was. He was a guard from that time in that ugly place. She said she froze He walked right up to her and said, you've mentioned Ravenbrook in your message. I was a guard there. But since then, I've become a Christian and God has forgiven me for what I did. Sister, would you forgive me? And he put out his hand for it to be engaged. Corey writes in her book, she says, here I am given a message about forgiveness and I can't forgive. All of the pain came rushing back in that moment. Her sister gone, all that she lost. She says in that moment, she began to fumble in her purse to avoid and actually ignore this guard before her. In that moment, fumbling through her purse, she said she said a prayer. She said, Jesus, I can't forgive. I can raise my hand up, but that's all I can do. You're gonna have to do the rest. She writes, she put her hand up. He engaged her hand. And in a moment, she said a warmth shot down her arm through her hand and a release of warmth and healing overcame her like never before. She writes in her book, I had never experienced God's love so intensely than I did in that moment. She said, I forgive you, I forgive you. And in that moment, set herself free. Church, you will never have the feeling in and of yourself to forgive. You ask God for his strength 
and he will help you go the length to forgive. See, finally, we've covered two reasons why we fail to forgive. The first, we fear that forgiveness equals acceptance. The second, we think forgiveness is a feeling. But I don't want to give you another reason why we fail to forgive. I want to end by making the connection between failure and forgiveness. Recognizing your failure, owning your failure, and the forgiveness that is unleashed and the level by which it's unleashed. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36, this is one of the most beautiful accounts. It says, then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. She stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed his feet, anointed them with the fragrant oil. What's the context here? First of all, she's in a house filled with religious leaders who look down upon a woman of the night. We know that she is a prostitute, but here she is breaking through barriers, completely not caring what other people think of her because she heard about a man who loves, a man who had compassion, a man who could heal, a man who extends forgiveness, and she amazingly takes something she had once used in that occupation of prostitution, her hair. This was a tool of seduction for a woman of the streets. And she uses that same tool of seduction as a tool of submission. And she surrenders it at the feet of Jesus. And she anoints him with that oil, which was costly. She, church, in a word, worshiped. And she didn't care what people thought. See, it's not about what's natural to me in worship. I'm not wired, my predisposition, I'm reserved. That's a lot of men's narrative. I don't raise my hand to God because it's just not the way I'm wired. I go, yeah, well, it's not about you. It's about a good God who deserves your surrender and your submission. The problem isn't the style of worship. The problem is your distance from Jesus. Now, when the Pharisee who invited Jesus saw this, he spoke to himself. Now, I conjecture, I don't know if he speaks audibly, verbally, but I believe this is him in his heart having these thoughts. Nobody could hear him, and he says within himself, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, do you see the indictment here? He's in his heart having a thought about a woman, and Jesus hears this thought and has a thought for him. In other words, here he is saying about Jesus in regards to the woman, and here Jesus is in regards to the woman saying about him. Jesus then says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon says, Simon says. <laughs> Simon says, shout amen. amen. Oh, try it again. Say amen. amen. Oh, Simon did not say. <laughs> you guys are bad at this game. Jesus said, so there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, 500 days wage. The other 50, 50 days wage. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Do, do you see how Jesus often uses monetary values to explain forgiveness and mercy? Simon answers and says, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Jesus said, you have rightly judged. Now here's the lesson. He turned to the woman and said to Simon. I love that. Jesus turns to the woman and says to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. This woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I, the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, 
the same loves little. Translation, she loves much because she realizes how much she's been forgiven. She, before that song was written, recognized her sins are many, but his mercy is more. And because she wrapped her soul around God's mercy, it drove her into humility. Finally, the lesson is crucial for us, and it's that those who recognize they have been forgiven the most, which should be all of us, will love God best, which should be all of us. So you might be good compared to your neighbor, but how do you stand in the presence of the Creator? See, it's in His presence where I come undone like this woman. And I realize I can go forgive because I've been forgiven. So please allow me to adapt a most famous line from Luke 12, 48, which you know it. It says, to whom much is given, much is required. But I say, to whom much is forgiven, much is required. My prayer is that not a single person leaves this morning without realizing you've been forgiven by God Almighty, that you need to forgive others around you. Hurts from your past need to be cut today. And you need to own the forgiveness that you have for yourself. That's a big part of this too. People have a hard time forgiving themselves. That might have been my narrative until I realized in that moment, if I say that what I did against God was greater than what he did on the cross, then how dare I? That was a dangerous place to be. And I realized in that moment that what Jesus did was enough. So don't leave here and be like, read a religion. You know, read a religion, right? She'll leave and She'll get me at the door and say, Pastor, what an amazing message today. Awesome. The illustrations, the stories, this is a great message. Thank you. No, seriously, one of the best I've heard. Everything you said today applies to somebody else I know. (laughs) Don't do that. See, this is the beauty of the gospel. Jesus loves us, not because we desired it. He died for us not because we asked for it. He forgives us, not because we deserve it. He did it all to demonstrate that our greatest need is his greatest deed. Church, we are forgiven to live, and we are forgiven to forgive. Now, I am not going to belabor this moment. It's going to last 60 seconds tops. But if the Holy Spirit is impressing upon your heart that you need prayer to forgive, You need the prayer to know you're forgiven, but you also need the strength and the mercy of God to go forgive. Maybe that person that you need to forgive, you have no access to, something from your past, but you need to let it go. 60 seconds, I'm asking anyone in this assembly to leave your comfortable seat and allow me to pray over you at this altar. If that's you, you come. 60 seconds, will not belabor this. I'm not one of those altar call dudes, but I believe that if you want prayer and you want to cut that tie of unforgiveness, bitterness, or resentfulness, you come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've seen tears this morning. Thank you, Jesus. God knows each and every one of you. He knows your background, your backstory. He knows the offenses. He knows the transgressions. He knows everything that has happened against you. He's known what you've done. And in this moment, he is asking all of us to consider his scriptures, his truth, his gospel, his good news. Thank you. Here's one of the most beautiful things for me as I pray for you, is that those tears that are falling down your cheek, God keeps in a bottle. And they weigh something to him. They're valuable. They're priceless. And he never wants to see his children harboring bitterness. And we have a mighty God that the cross exclaims, I love you to death. And he wants to sever any ties of unforgiveness and bitterness in hearts. You don't have to come forward to receive this prayer. But God sees those with acts of confidence who have come forward. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this assembly. Those you know, I don't know. You know every detail of their lives. You actually created them. Lord, you've called them to yourself. 
At whatever time in their life they came to you to know you, perhaps that fire has dwindled, perhaps a hurt or an offense was too great to get over, but in this moment, because of the cross, it is severed. Holy Spirit, fall upon these people. Cut the ties of unforgiveness. Remind them who they are, that you are a good, good Father, and your forgiveness is swift, it's free, it's full, it's forever. It's for them. Lord, thank you for remembering our sins no more. There's somebody in this group, Lord God, that has a trespasser who they do not have access to. Something happened to them when they were growing up. Abuse, you know what it is. And you didn't allow that to shame them. Lord, you allowed that into their lives to give them a story to shape them. But I pray now in their heart, they let it go. They release it. Lord, they let you deal with it. Set them free as you set me free. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.